Welcome uh, to Church Connect. Uh, we're so glad you are joining today. It's been quite a week. Uh, there's been lots of snow, there's ice, school and event cancellations. It's been quite a week. Uh, we trust that you have been safe and are hopeful as a new week begins. It's nice to be here with Stephanie, uh, who we'll further introduce in just a moment. But let me remind you um, of a couple uh, community announcements. Most specifically, Alpha begins January 21st. And again, thank you to the kitchen and host teams for all the work they're doing. And of course, for those that are attending, uh, we imagine these will be very exciting and very informative evenings. It's still not too late uh, to invite someone uh, to attend yourself. I encourage you to head to our website for more information. In just a few moments, uh, Luke uh, will be coming uh, to continue in our how-to series. But before he does, um, it's, I I'm excited today uh, to be talking with Stephanie Jackson, who is uh, team leader for our local work team, our team, yeah. uh, me, you and me, yeah. uh, TJ, uh, Marsha, and Lee. Uh, we meet regularly, and we're excited to share uh, some updates with you today. Uh, we carry in our hearts a primary verse. Um, it, it, it brings concern. Uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, it calls us to action. Do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. How do we do this? Well, uh, the first thing is that we want to inform. So it's important for us to be regularly reminded that people are hurting and suffering within our local community. We hope that our congregation is aware of specific concerns within our local community that re relate to practical social concerns. We hope our community will consider the specific needs of vulnerable populations, people living in poverty, immigrants and refugees, elderly people who are homeless, and people who have been trafficked or are at risk. The next part is we want to inspire. So Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Our lifestyle and choices explain and express our love for God. Uh, we are of a mind that everyone has the potential to come alongside another. Um, and the third one is to be involved, so in involvement. 1 John 3, 18 says, let's not merely say that we love each other, let us show the truth by our actions. The gospel involves a call to action. We hope that as a community, both personally, our friends, our families, we will get involved with community activities that address local social concerns, building uh, community building and fundraising for local uh, community groups. A, a role that's been entrusted to our local work team is to make a recommendation, a regular recommendation for our mm -hmm. church's generosity disbursement. Uh, for example, as we spoke last December to our community, uh, sharing the, the distribution of our church's generosity fund, it was so awesome uh, for our team to be able to be involved in delivering uh, those checks uh, to local groups. And you can see the pictures on the screen of those wonderful moments of exchange where we as a community uh, were able to invest and bless some local uh, uh, organizations are doing some amazing things. Yes, yes, it was so exciting for me to deliver a generosity check to Langley Boys and Girls Club yeah. uh, that serves the most vulnerable inner city kids with a safe place, an encouraging place to be after school and for high school students even, in the evening there's a place of safety for them as well. There's uh, some amazing community groups that yeah. are serving people so well. Yeah. And it's so good to be able to support them. How, how can others get involved? Um, we would just say if you have an interest, a passion for justice, a heart for your community, a heart for the marginalized, we'd love to talk to you about how you can get more involved uh, in local work within our community. Also, there's an event coming up, an annual event called Coldest Night of the Year. Coldest Night of the Year uh, is a fundraiser that supports Gateway of Hope, which is Langley's only homeless shelter. It happens every February. It's being scheduled again for this year, and we hope that you would sign up uh, and join our team. Um, what's involved? You sign up, join our team on the website through our um, through the links that are on, on our website. You donate, you sign up, you donate and fundraise, and then we come together for a walk uh, in the, uh, near the end of February. It's a really exciting time 
to be with hundreds of people who are supporting uh, Langley's only homeless shelter. All our information is on our website. We hope that you would consider uh, joining our team this year. Yes, and our local work team will be serving refreshments on the street again for all who are walking. So come on out and let's make a difference this year for those who are unhoused. Again, we're so excited about what God's doing in our community. And with great excitement, we continue to appreciate the benefits of each one of us being involved, informed, and inspired towards, again, love being in action hmm. and helping other people. Um, so again, thanks for uh, all you're doing as a community. I really look forward to a good year ahead. Yes. So head to our website to learn more. Good days are ahead. Hi, folks. Good to be with you. My name is Luke, and I'm going to be sharing today in our How To series. Last week, Kirsten kicked us off with How To Pray, and today we're talking about How To Read The Bible. In the new series, we're just asking key questions. How and, and why do we pray? Why and how do we read the Bible? Why and how do we serve? Why and how do we share our faith? Uh, these practices have given shape to countless Christian lives. How are they giving shape to our lives? These are not so much things that Christians do. They are, in a way, how to be Christian at all. But as many of us know, uh, these practices uh, don't always feel user-friendly. Uh, we live in a society which prizes consumerism and convenience, and these practices often run against those values. There's exceptions, of course, but these things tend to take discipline, even sacrifice. But as we also know, the thing about essential things which bring life is the tendency to take them for granted or even neglect them to our detriment. It's a little like, I think, uh, staying well hydrated. We all know that water is essential to life, and yet many of us would confess that we're probably underhydrated. The crucial foundations to our physical health can be neglected, and so too it is with our spiritual health, and before long it, we're undernourished. So, without being legalistic or boring, how can we encourage one another towards what we know we need in order to flourish. And what do we need to know about these practices of prayer and Bible reading and serving and sharing? What do we need to know about these practices if we're going to be shaped by Jesus through them? Kirsten shared last week on how to pray. And this week, I'll talk about how to read the Bible. We do want to reiterate that no one is claiming expertise here. In fact, if you sense at times that we're a little sheepish about sharing on these topics, it might be because we're all well aware that mastery in these practices is impossible. The lack of hydration is something that everybody suffers from. We're going to do our best. Of course, we always trust Jesus to make up the difference. There's only so much that we can say on the topic of how to read the Bible in a few minutes. So these Sundays are not meant to be discussions uh, uh, enders, but discussion starters. We also want to avoid kind of laying heavy burdens on one another. We're all tired of being told that we're not healthy enough or there's a, a, a hill of self-improvement that we better climb. So we're wary of those pitfalls, but we're still committed to encouraging health practices as a Christian community. To that end, let's mix it up today and start with some tools before teaching when it comes to how to read the Bible. Let's talk about some resources. First, big invitation to join us on January 29th. It's a Monday night for an in-depth grow session called How to Read the Bible with Rick Watts. If you're serious about getting to know the Bible and getting it involved in your regular life, letting it shape you, this is going to be a key evening to prioritize. We're also going to record and release the session on podcast to make it accessible as possible. If you don't know Rick, he is a, a biblical scholar and he's a gift to us in this regard. Books are also helpful, aren't they? And one of the most influential books on the topic of how to read the Bible is a book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. Everyone who wants to read the Bible with some confidence and clarity should own this book. If you're going to have one tool, this is a good start. Another resource we'll direct you to is something called the Bible Project Online, which is a great library of short videos about the Bible and its contents. 
And these videos uh, efficiently and creatively put a lot together for you. They can be especially helpful in family life for kids and teenagers and young adults. The final tool I recommend is to ensure that you have a decent study Bible at home, if possible. And everybody has their preference on translation, but we'd probably recommend a recent uh, NIV study Bible. It includes add-on articles. It's gathered together world experts on each book of the Bible to give notes. And in fact, our very own Rick Watts has provided notes for Mark's gospel. So there you go. Usually we kind of end with resources or tools, but we may as well begin with them today. Uh, if you've heard nothing else today, uh, take some action in 24 uh, to better equip yourself in scriptural engagement by accessing the tools that we've curated. And as always, just remember that our pastoral team is at your service to sit and talk about any of these topics, prayer, Bible reading, or what have you, anytime. If you want to learn more about these things, we're here to help you with that. No question is off limits, and we'd love to provide guidance or direct you to someone in our community you could also learn from. If you really want to learn to pray or read the Bible, there are people who can show you how and walk with you out of a great wealth of personal experience, and we'd love to direct you to those people in our church. Okay, we're going to spend the rest of our time today in four areas. What is the Bible? Can we read the Bible? How do we read the Bible? And getting practical. Let's start by asking, what is the Bible? And for that, we're going to turn to the resource that I mentioned a moment ago from the Bible Project. The Bible. It's one of the most influential books in human history. It explores the big questions of why we exist. It's inspired many people to do amazing things. And confused many others. And you've probably got one sitting around somewhere. So, what is the Bible actually? Well, the Bible is a small library of books that all emerged out of the history of the people of ancient Israel. And in one sense, they were just like any other ancient civilization. But among them were a long line of individuals called prophets. And they viewed Israel's story as anything but ordinary. They saw it as a central part of what God was doing for all humanity. And these prophets were literary geniuses. Really? Yeah, they expertly crafted the Hebrew language to write epic narratives, very sophisticated poetry. They were masters of metaphor and storytelling, and they leveraged all of this to explore life's most complicated questions about death and life and the human struggle. So there's a lot of different authors writing this book. Yeah, and these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt, then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually they were conquered by the Babylonians who took them away into exile. Then at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures began to be formed into the shape that we have them today. Okay, the Jewish Bible, what's in it? Well, in Hebrew, it's called by an acronym, Tanakh. The T stands for Torah, sometimes called the law. That's Israel's five book foundation story. The N stands for Nevi'im, the Hebrew word for prophets. And this section consists of the historical books that tell Israel's story from the prophet's point of view. Then you get the poetic books of the prophets themselves. The K stands for Ketavim, the Hebrew word for writings. This is a diverse collection of poetic books, wisdom books, and more narrative. And the Jewish people believe that through all of these literary works, God speaks to his people. Now, there were other Jewish writings being produced during this second temple period as well. Yeah, a really diverse group of texts. And these two were highly valued in Jewish communities. And there was debate from ancient times about whether or not some of these should be considered part of their scriptures. So this is a lot of different writings over a long period of time. Why did they put them all together like this? Well, altogether, these texts tell an epic story about how God is working through these people to bring order and beauty out of the chaos of our world. And it all builds up to a hope for a new leader who would come and renew all creation. And then the Tanakh concludes, and this leader never comes. So it's an expertly crafted work, but it's missing an ending? That's exactly right. Now, a few centuries later, a Jewish prophet comes onto the scene named Jesus of Nazareth. He claimed he was carrying the Tanakh story forward. Yeah, so Jesus did a bunch of cool stuff. 
was killed, but his followers claimed he was alive from the dead. Yeah, they said that Jesus was that long-awaited leader who would restore the world. And so his earliest followers, called apostles, they composed new literary works about the story of Jesus. They called these good news or the gospel. They formed an account called Acts about the spread of the Jesus movement outside of Israel. And then they circulated letters to different Jesus communities all around the ancient world. And they saw these writings as part of the scripture. Yeah, the apostles wrote all of this as the fulfillment of that epic story found in the Tanakh. And they were continuing the literary genius of the Jewish tradition. They also believed that God was speaking to his people through these texts alongside the scriptures of Israel. So that's the Old and New Testament. But what did the early Christians think of the other Second Temple literature? Well, different groups had different views about some of these books, but we know they read them and valued these texts because they passed them along with the Jewish scriptures. Okay, so we've got the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. We got these other Second Temple period works then the writing of the apostles about Jesus. And that's a lot of literature, so what's in my Bible? So the Christian movement has taken different forms over 2,000 years, and from the beginning, all Christians recognized the Tanakh and the New Testament as scripture. And for centuries, much of the Second Temple literature was read as part of the biblical tradition. The Catholic Church eventually made it official and called some of the books from this collection the Deuterocanonical books. Some Orthodox churches used even more books from this Second Temple literature. And then in the 1500s, during the Reformation, Protestant Christians wanted to go back to the oldest writings of the prophets and apostles, so they accepted only the Old and New Testaments. Okay, I think I got it. But how does a collection of books produced over a thousand years by all these different authors tell one unified story? Yeah, that's the question we'll address in our next video. Well, there is some great background on what the Bible is. Now, in light of all that information that we just took in, the question that might be coming to your mind is, can I even read the Bible? I think there's two extremes when we come to this question, a kind of yes or no answer. On one hand, taking in what we heard a moment ago, you might feel like saying, no, I don't think I can read the Bible. It seems incredibly out of reach. It's written in an ancient language. It's steeped in distant history and custom. It can feel inaccessible. And there are those who will even tell you that that is the case, that you need a bunch of fancy letters behind your name to even begin to comprehend the Bible's original meaning let alone how it might translate to your life today. There's even some who would take pride in totally demolishing people's trust in the Bible uh, or their chances of being influenced by it. And they do, in a sense, have a bit of a case. You know, the Bible is not something we can casually or flippantly open without expectation of an effort to understand it. But it's also a shame when people use the intellectual respect we should have for the Bible to kind of slam it shut on our noses or demolish our trust in what we have learned simply from Scripture at an early age or, or as adults. The other extreme to the question of can I read the Bible is an overly simplistic and irreverent yes. There are some approaches to reading the Bible which can quite frankly hold Scripture with little to no respect. Reading it like we might a little bit of paper you get in a fortune cookie. We may read the Bible this way. Uh, we tend to think that we have everything we need in ourselves to accept or reject what we read based on what we like or, or don't like. So if we're not mindful, we can be unthoughtful, pressing the Bible through a narrow personal lens rather than working to understand it in its context and content. We don't give the Bible the reverence it deserves or approach it with curiosity and humility, and that can be a problem. We should respect the Bible as an ancient and complex library. But far more importantly, there is the reverence we might hold for the Bible, not because it's an incredible historical library, but as the central text of the Christian faith. And beyond that, more importantly, a reverence for scripture, because as Christians, we trust that is the very word of God, living and active and authoritative in our lives. In other words, we read the Bible with reverence 
because of who stands behind it. The Gospel of John holds a moment when Jesus' first followers are faced with the opportunity to unfollow him or to keep following him after he gives this difficult teaching. Jesus asks them if they're going to unfollow him. And famously, Simon Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What do we have uh, if we don't have the living message in the middle of our shared lives? You know, when we take a moment to remember that reality, some of our fortune cookie readings or cold, high-minded academic readings of the Bible can feel pretty silly. Christians believe that Jesus is at the center of all of this. We're yielding to and devoting ourselves to him, trying to follow him under the direction of his word, under the direction of scripture. And I would add to this that as many of us have experienced, the Bible upon a simple reading can be incredibly powerful because it's alive and active among us. There are countless stories out there of uh, those like one 20th century German Bible scholar who had a dramatic encounter with the gospel of Mark, which set his life on a totally new course. This young man was in Scotland in 1945. He was a prisoner of war, a German prisoner of war in Scotland. And as one writer puts it, he and his fellow prisoners had just been shown photographs of the horrors of the camps and were dealing with the nightmare realization that they'd been fighting for a regime that was responsible for unimagined atrocity. He had little Christian background and no theological education, but when an army chaplain distributed copies of the Bible, this young man said this, I read Mark's gospel as a whole and came to the story of the passion. When I heard Jesus' death cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I felt growing within me the conviction. This is someone who understands you completely, who is with you in your cry to God and has felt the same forsakenness that you are living in now. I summoned the courage to live again. What an incredible story. This young man's life takes a totally different turn. After uh, serving in the German army under a, a horrific regime, he becomes a Christian, he becomes a biblical scholar, and the world was actually transformed by some of his teaching. The Holy Spirit enlivens and applies scripture in all kinds of surprising ways, even just when we open it and read it. So all that said, what's the answer? Can we read the Bible? The answer, I think, is yes. I'd go so far as to say that the Bible wants to be read because God wants to be known. That's one of its central themes, humans knowing and being known by God. So we should revere the Bible and we should expect to be able to read it. Reading the Bible with reverence is a good place to start. This approach holds together the possibility that God can speak to us right now the Holy Spirit active in its reading and explanation. And this approach holds a humility in our reading. First, because this is God's word to us, but also because when we read or hear something we don't understand, we don't simply pass judgment, but explore further with curiosity, knowing there's a great deal we probably don't know about what we're reading. Read it and revere it. The Bible wants to be read because God wants to be known. Let's move to that second question. How do we read the Bible? I'll share four simple points here, though of course we could add more. First, as Christians, it's wise to start with Jesus. That might sound obvious, but it can be strangely forgotten. Some read the Bible with a preoccupation, uh, no preoccupation rather, of getting to know and follow Jesus. Imagine trying to be Christian without focusing on the person whose name is in the title. <laughs> um, this is why we spend so much time in the Gospels as a church, you might notice, because the Gospels deal with the central figure of the Bible, God among his people as seen through Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that the rest of the Bible isn't important or shouldn't be read, far from it. But there is a real danger in people spending all kinds of time reading and discussing the Bible and never really focusing on Jesus. As Christians, we believe that if you want to know what God is like, 
You look at Jesus. So our general Sunday approach over the years has been to start with Jesus in the Gospels and then work out in various aspects of community groups and learning from there. We want to study and follow Jesus closely. So if you're wondering where to start with the Bible at home, get stuck into the Gospels because they are the biographies of Jesus. Of course, uh, we can't really understand Jesus fully without understanding the history he emerges from, and that's ancient Israel's story. So you might also consider getting to know about some of the first books of the Bible, Genesis and Exodus, because those are crucial in understanding who Jesus is. But if we're going to start out trying to follow Jesus, it does help to actually start with him and follow the breadcrumbs elsewhere to the story he emerges from, and then the influence after him in the rest of the Bible. So first, follow Jesus. Second, uh, eat your greens. Similar to prayer, there is something about the volume of consumption when it comes to the Bible that makes a difference. Usually, the more you pray, the more time you're giving God to get at you and shape you. Similarly, the more we read the Bible, the more chances we're giving God to shape us by his spirit through his word. If we expect to be shaped by God without regular engagement and learning from the Bible, we probably won't be. Now, this is the moment people in my age range sometimes get their knickers in a twist because we're turned off pretty quickly uh, by what we might perceive as lifeless rules. Just by someone saying we won't be shaped by God if we don't apply ourselves to prayer and Bible reading, we feel like saying, beware, legalism and oppression. You know, and, and I understand that. When I was a teenager, Jesus following became a little too task oriented at times. If you pick up my Bible from those days, uh, you'll find check marks next to chapters. The more check marks next to each chapter, the more holy I thought I was getting, even the more I thought God liked me. And this kind of approach is not what I mean when I say, eat your greens. Eating your greens is simply to say that when we ingest God's word weekly and daily, without becoming legalistic or lifeless, we, we do still experience a great deal of transformation. We give ourselves a much better chance of being shaped by the Bible if we actually open it. So if our Bible isn't open, what is one way we could open it this week? Could we put it somewhere or keep the app open on our phone? What is one simple step towards giving ourselves the best chance of interacting with the Bible with growing regularity? So start with Jesus, eat your greens. Third, ask questions. When it comes to scripture, we do need to educate our palates, which is a phrase I've borrowed from our friend Rick, meaning that we don't always know what we're reading. So it's going to take some curiosity and learning. We might consider getting a notebook out, reading a passage and writing down the questions that come to our mind. That is a form of engaging with the Bible. It's a good place to start. This is an interaction, which means it may be slow and take some time, but it also means it can bring change. Last week, Kirsten used the Lord's Prayer as this example of how to pray, a kind of form that we might follow. She got this prayer by Jesus from, you guessed it, the Bible. So when we do things like pray the Lord's Prayer, we are in fact interacting with the Bible, but the Lord's Prayer is more than just a form to follow, isn't it? It's steeped in ancient Israel's history, and it shows us the shape of Jesus' work and action in the world. So we can pray the Lord's Prayer as a form, but we can also study and ask questions of it. For example, why is forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us smack in the middle of that prayer from Jesus? What does that mean? Where does that idea come from in scripture before Jesus? What was Jesus doing with that in relation to his life and death and resurrection? And what implications do words like that carry for our everyday lives? What do words about forgiveness have to do with that friend at school who's hurt me or the coworker who's rude and hard to work with? There's a lot to learn about the Bible and a lot to be learned through the Bible. Asking questions, opening ourselves to change while reading the Bible is where the rubber really hits the road. And depending on our familiarity with the Bible, this happens at various levels. 
the questions we might ask as someone who's totally unfamiliar with the Bible will be different than someone who has studied it, let's say, professionally. And that's okay. It also helps to know that there are some parts of the Bible which are more accessible than others, which we're going to get into in that grow session. The point is to learn and be shaped in our character from the Bible so that we look more like Jesus under the instruction of his word. So start with Jesus, eat your greens, ask questions, or as Rick might say, educate your palate. And finally, go for it. You know, we live in a really special time and place in history. Not long ago, the Bible was somewhat, you know, closed to people like you and me. But we now have this unprecedented access to the Bible and tools for reading it. In a couple of weeks, someone in our church, John Imbo, is being installed as the president of Wycliffe Bible Translators Canada, which is a group that takes the Bible and puts it into languages that it isn't already in around the world, and actually even here in Canada. Living Waters has supported global workers from Wycliffe for many years, and these folks do the hard and patient work of translating the Bible into new languages that it hasn't been written in yet. And when you look at the work of groups like Wycliffe, you begin to appreciate how rich we are in scriptural access. We've got the Bible in our languages and many helpful tools. So we don't need to fear the Bible. We can get on with reading it reverently, expecting to be changed together. We have more than enough to benefit from the shaping of scripture than probably anyone else on the planet and in history. That is so exciting because it means that we can get to know Jesus better through his word. And anything is possible when we start doing that. So that's a little on what is the Bible? Can we even read the Bible? How do we read the Bible? Let's close with a couple of practical cues. And I think two helpful approaches with reading the Bible broadly are this. Thinking about growth over goals and tools over rules. If we're going to go for it, let's remember that this is about growth over goals. Growth in Jesus over goals, meaning that setting a goal is great and adhering to disciplines are great. Taking action is good so long as it's in service of genuine growth. So a question I'd leave with us today is, what's motivating you to pick up the Bible? Or what's holding you back from picking up the Bible? Think about that. If we want to grow, we're helped by asking those kinds of questions and starting at the root of our motivations. Aim at growth and let the goal be in service of that growth. This isn't about getting good grades with God, but about being educated and nurtured in our humanity under Jesus' instruction and care. And if we want to grow, we might think in terms of tools over rules. And by that, I mean, we should spend more time being curious and discovering tools to help us engage the Bible, be those people or books or resources, rather than having a, I had better read the Bible approach in the form of kind of lifeless or unhelpful rules. Bible plans and devotionals and these sorts of things are awesome so long as they're in service of our diligent focus on Jesus and his word and our growth in becoming more like him. And let's be perfectly clear. Jesus loves you because he just loves you, not because you read or didn't read all of 2 Kings at 4 a.m. tomorrow morning. Here's a last thought. If you don't know where to start or feel deep down you need to start again, why not begin with the Lord's Prayer this week? These are Jesus' words to his first disciples, showing them not only how to pray, but how to live. Why not try reading it a few times this week, writing it out even, which slows us down, or reading more about it if you have some tools laying around? Or better yet, why not try asking Jesus in a simple time of prayer what part of his prayer needs to come through in your life this week? What is he saying to us through his prayer about himself, about ourselves, about the world around us? Now we're cooking with gas, using Jesus' words to interact with him 
letting those same words encourage and shape us. We're saying to Jesus, Jesus, give us this day our daily bread. And that's our prayer as we conclude today. Jesus, give us this day our daily bread. Let it shape us and nourish us so we can follow you and know you deeply. Bless you. Thanks for joining us today.